Damn. Unmuted, unfiltered, savage of savages. <sighs> one of the few, one of the few, let me say that again. One of the few guys that has started such like a pup like I did. Um, and I, I don't mean like like Disneyland kind of working out stuff. I mean like seriously lifting like a, a mental case like myself. Um, this cat, Lee Priest, is someone that has been in the industry over three decades. Someone that his, uh, I love the fact that he, he beat Ronnie Coleman. That's just, that's such a savagery of who he is. Um, I like him because I, I think today's society or the snowflakes of, of today, um, we call him toxic. I love him because he's unfiltered he's real he says what he believes um and it's unfortunate for you guys but i believe i agree with everything he says so um you're gonna mute him you're gonna mute me uh, but also he's not one of these guys when when he was at golds in the early 90s and stuff he's not one of these guys that would lift like all the guys i tell you like francis benefato trained with me all these guys that trained with me that you may think didn't train heavy, all trained heavy. Sorry to tell you, man, they all trained heavy. And that's why they just look different to me. It's why they looked, uh, I don't know, better, oh, better. But Lee Priest, let's bring this man on. You got it, you got it. Look at that. Woo -hoo -hoo. Oh. Hi, Good afternoon. <laughs> it is morning for you. It is 10 o'clock there in Australia. Yes, I've been up for six hours already. You know, as you get older, you get up early. I'm up at 4 a.m. every day. <laughs> you, you're living my lifestyle, getting up early like that. Mm -hmm. Then I'm in bed by half past eight, probably at night. <laughs> you're as lame as I am then. <laughs> we're yeah, we're to bed early. No up. Lie. Look at me. I don't even shave anymore. What's going Come on? on? Come on. Uh, you're a race car driver, so you, you're supposed to have that edge now, the, the scruff. The oh. attitude, pop the top I used at to be. any time. I used How's to be going? a race car driver like I used to be a bodybuilder and used to be, used to be a lot of things. How's now, the race car driving going? I haven't done it since pretty much I left America, really, because over there I had the sponsors and that. So moving back home, there's a little bit of race car stuff back here, but not like in America. America, you could go racing every weekend. Here, you might be lucky to go once a month you know people want to build new tracks here but oh you can't build a track out there because too much noise or you can't build a track there because there's the one rare green spotted tree frog that you might destroy its habitat so you know you can't do fuck all anymore <laughs> how's the uh lifting going because i want to show a picture of what you look like right now if that's all right oh, oh please don't <laughs> It looks good. The team is uh the team has already prepped some of that stuff because we were looking over. Well, I hope your I hope your team done Photoshop before they put the picture up. <laughs> they don't need to do Photoshop on you, brother. We're before Photoshop. Um, yeah, throw that up there. Throw it up there. Yeah, man. Oh, good. Kid, look at this. Now people tent. go. People go. Oh, look at all the hair. Look at all the hair. I'm like. Well, I'm not competing. Why would I want to shave for? Plus, at my age, the hair on me adds another two inches, so I leave the hair on. <laughs> See, you're, you're, you've wised up over the years. Uh, um, the funny thing was, though, because I'm doing like a transformation because I'm with Dave now in Species. You know, I did the transformation years ago with Muscle Tech, and Muscle Tech was like, Lee, we need some before pictures, so it looked pretty bad. So I was like, okay. I was bulked up like I normally get. And then I'll take a photo and I'd really flex my arm. They're like, no, don't flex your arm. Just hold it in the pose, but don't flex it. So I'm just like, okay. So the before pictures that I sent Dave two weeks ago, I figured Dave would just hold on to these because, because you know, people always say, oh, you're using this lighting, use that lighting. I got a hallway light that has those shitty, like this light here. It's like an orange color bulb. So it looks crap. I didn't pump up. This was like before bed. I'm like, said to the wife, Oh, fuck, Dave needs those photos. Let's do them. So I didn't pump up, got the shitty lighting, took them. And then I thought, oh, Dave will hang on to them. And he'll wait for me to do the transformation. And then he'll put them side by side. I go to bed. I get up at 4 a.m. 
about to have my coffee. I go online. I'm like, what the fuck? He's posted them. <laughs> like, you already threw them up. Oh, well, I figured, well, I figured no matter what happens from this point on, I can't look any worse. So even if I figured if I just go and shave now, put a tan on and pump up, I'll look 100% better. People are like, oh, wow, what a transformation. <laughs> so how, if this is, how many weeks do you have? Uh, he said I can do 12, 12 to 16, just the change and that. But I'm coming over there in nine weeks. So once I know I get there, the diet's out the window. So <laughs> so it might be a 10-week, 11-week transformation. Because I figured in another four weeks, I'm just going to shave, like I said, pump up and do some more photos. And that could be it because I've gone from eating, like I would eat somewhat clean, but then if I had chicken and rice and vegetables for lunch, in between I might have a chocolate bar, but then I might have steak and rice. But just having that little tiny bit of junk food, when I go to train, I feel better. I got more energy and right. stuff like that. So now I've just gone to chicken and rice and for chicken and potato, steak. And it's almost like a freaking contest diet. But, you know, I'm on a contest diet with no drugs. I'm taking 300 milligrams of test every 10 days. That's it. So I'm thinking now two weeks going from eating what I want to this, the second week, I'm like, oh, I got no energy now. This sucks. I didn't diet this hard for a contest. So now I had a bag of Easter eggs the other day, but I didn't tell Dave yet. So I was like, fuck this shit. I was like, I had the Easter eggs, but then the next day I went to the gym. I had all this energy. I trained hard. I did cardio hard. So it's like, I'm just going to throw in a little bit of junk every now and then because, you know, once you get to 50, life's too short to be on a diet all the time. So I don't know how you stay so lean all the time. I'm like, fuck that. <laughs> so question then for these guys because they're going to look at that photo that I just showed and, and they're going to I, I know society's mm -hmm. going to go wait a minute how can you be on that little of, of tea and look like you do why mm -hmm. why is there no comprehension of uh, the work that you've done that you maintain some of that dense muscle mostly for mm -hmm. you and me we started so young before puberty mm -hmm. And exactly. we've built such a foundation. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it's it's interesting that I think let me ask you this and let you answer. So I've seen through the decades, uh, back when you and I were lifting in in Venice, we there was a lot of us teenagers that did it for sports or or, or weightlifted prior to puberty, and we built this foundation mm -hmm. and then we added on to it. It seems as though today guys don't really start training till mid 20s mm -hmm. after that growth spurt and all that mm -hmm. stuff and then they don't really do any kind of foundation work they just get on the shit and go yeah and, um, and that's true because like i started competing like you know as you know i was 13 years old when i won my first three bodybuilding shows and from 13 to 19 i was natural so you got roughly seven years being natural and people go, but at 19, why'd you take him just before I Wait a minute, wait a minute, jump back, jump back, bet mm -hmm. on that. Hold on, hold okay. on, because you said you competed at 13, right? Yeah, I won three shows at 13 years but old. But how long were you training before even you competed? Uh, eight months. Jeez, okay, so it was it was only seven seven years of, all right, keep going, keep going. Yeah, so like, then people go, well, why'd you have to use them at 19 then, just before you turned 20? I said, well... At 17, I won my national title, like I've said yeah. before, but they said I was too young to go pro. So I won again at 18. They still said I was too young. I won at 19. And that's when I came over when Lou Zouic brought me to America and I was going to do the amateur Niagara Falls. And then I got my pro card. So now I'm just 19 turning 20. I figure, well, as good as I am naturally, I'm going up against guys who have got great genetics, but they're on gear. So for me to keep up with them, sadly, I'm going to have to use gear. So I did so. But all that foundation work, like you said, from the young age when you're in your teens, your testosterone level should be through the roof. That's why I don't understand when teenagers want to get on test. I'm like, why? As a young kid, your body's full of it. And that's why when I did take it, even when I was in my 20s and 30s, the most I ever took of test, and people still don't believe me, was 400 milligrams a week. I tried 800. I felt like shit. Sus 250, I used 2 mil, which was meant to be 500, if it's real. But I said... Look, if you've got enough testosterone in your body, which I do naturally, I want to take some and add to that. Whereas young kids now, they're taking so much, they're just shutting their natural level down. And sometimes it doesn't turn back on. They've got to stay on it all the time. But as a teenage young kids these days, if you just eat correctly and train your ass off, 
you're going to fucking have a growth spurt like fucking no one else type thing. And, and that's the sad thing these days where young kids think, well, I've got to go on gear. And you've seen it before. Before they take gear, they probably half ass around with their training. They half ass around with their eating. They miss meals, skip meals. But now they're like, hold on, I'm going to take some gear. Now I'm on gear. I'm going to train every day. I'm going to eat six, seven meals. And I'm like, listen, if you took the gear out of it and you just went serious on your training and six, seven meals, you would have made the same fucking gains without the gear. And then it's like when they come off the gear, they go, well, I'm not on gear now. So they relax their training. Their eating goes back to shit. And then their size just goes, well, like those photos there, this is the first cycle I've been on in probably four years or maybe three and a half. Because when I had the neck operations and stuff, I figured I'd try a bit of DECA in 2015, 16 to see if that would help help the injury, but it didn't. So I'm like, ah, oh, fuck it. And I think, well, I'm not competing. Why worry about it? And like, like I said, I'd, I'd be still eating and training hard. And people go, well, how do you keep your muscle? I'm like, well, if I'm training and eating, why would I lose the muscle? It's like, it's not going to disappear on me. So Why is that? Why, so let me say this again. This is what he's saying. Let me just break this down to the most layman terms. Mm-hmm. To get better, you gotta you gotta eat more, you gotta train harder, and maybe you have to take some gear if that's what they want to do. But just to stay where your muscle is right there, all you gotta do is eat and train. Why do exactly. you think that suddenly, even if you eat and train, no, 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 it's gonna evaporate. It's you you can't you can't just eat good and train and keep the muscle. It doesn't work that way. Yeah, Why is always, that? I've never lost, and when I've come off cycles, I've never lost any size. Maybe depending if I was using Dianabol or something, you might use a little, lose a little bit of water weight, you know, a bit of puffiness. But overall size and that, I've always been the same. And I've told people my strongest lifts, when I squatted like seven plates or more, it was when I was off the gear. It was when I was in the off season, just bulked up. I was 285 pounds. I just had all that strength and body fat that were my strongest lifts. I relied on the drugs more for when I was getting ready for shows just to, spare my muscle from being chewed up because i was doing so much cardio i was on a restricted diet off season really if you're busting your ass in the gym training and eating you don't need gear if you're going to take it yes the only thing i found was occasionally it was good for recovery that was it it's like you know but young kids now rely on it so much as this magic pill and the amounts they use and then all this they don't come off they just bridge they blast they cruise i'm like i'd be off if i'd done 12 16 weeks before a contest say the Ironman, the Arnold Classic at the beginning of the year, and I qualified for the Olympia in September, I'd be off for four months or whatever until it was 12 weeks out from the Olympia. And I think that's what you've got to do. You've got to give your body a break. That's why even in the off-season, I'll go from dieting to eating what I want. So when I went back to my diet food, my body responded instantly. When I took a little bit, bit of gear again, my body responded. Because if you're on it, it's like anything. You do the same training program over and over. Your body gets used to it. You eat the same food day after day, the same amount of calories. Your body's going to remain the same. You've got yep. to shock it. And then these guys that stay on these large amount of drugs at a time, it's like it just get to a point where your body and the receptor sites are just like, hey, we're not going to change. And they just keep, well, that's not working. i got to up it more. i got to up it more. i got to up it more. And and now they're getting into, like I said, as well as the drugs. And now they're coming out with like the peptides and the psalms and that. It's like, you know, these things have never been proven. And I think, sadly, I think some of the psalms and peptides could be actually worse than steroids because I've had friends that take them and their blood pressure has gone through the roof. They feel like crap. They're like, oh, but they're not like drugs. These are natural type things. I'm like, yeah, well, natural vitamins, if you take too many, can kill you too. So, it's... so okay, then let me, because you, you ran over this and they probably won't pick up on this, but will you tell me what's more important? Is it the off season for that nine months or is it the mm-hmm. three months before a show, in your opinion? Off season, definitely. Why? Because uh, that's where you're going to, you know, make your gains. You're going to, you know, if you're going to grow muscle, that's when you're going to put on the muscle and, you know, make your best gains and results. And like I said, I was off the gear when I did that. When I got ready for a show, I pretty much knew, hey, even if I go on the gear, it's pretty much, like I said, just to hold on to the size I'm having because I'm restricting the calories. And mainly because, like, off season, I might train two hours a day, cardio three times a week. When I get ready for a contest, I'd train two hours in the morning, two hours at night, plus I'd do three hours of cardio a day, like an hour in the morning, hour at lunchtime, then an hour at night, just because Please. I had the time to do it and I right, enjoyed right, doing right. it. 
And if I did a bit more cardio, I could eat a little bit more food rather right. than starve myself. So, yeah, so the gear I took down was just mainly to help me recover and just stop me from wasting the muscle away because I was training a lot more and doing a lot more cardio off season. Like I said, that's when you're going to make your gains and stuff like that. And Okay, so because I think I have the hardest time telling new age people today or communicating this to today's world is that it is that nine months or it's the year or it's the two years off mm -hmm. season and just get ready for one show is, is such a hard sale because today they want it now. I want to get it now. I want to do mm -hmm. a show now. And you were just saying something. I can just hear the fans going, listen, I can take the whole year off, get on some gear, diet for three months and do a show. Yeah, you can. But you're going to retain nothing after the show and you're going to look. To, it's going to be just short lived. Yeah. And I always say, and I want people to understand, Lee is strong today. Lee is developed today because it's been a consistent life mm -hmm. style and these guys won't get that they're just going to go let me just do three months of gear and eat right uh -huh. <laughs> and then afterwards and I, and I never understood this because when i do expos like you have your whole career and i guarantee that you've never heard this either nobody's ever come up to you and said hey listen lee i'm incredible on my nutrition i have a hard time training because i've never heard that mm -hmm. i've heard i'm an animal in the gym i'm a freak dude i crush you but I can't diet well. And so yeah. I'm just trying to get this. And nutrition, and nutrition is such a huge part of it all, whether it be off-season and contest time. And I know I probably could have been a little bit better. There's a few years in the off-season where, you know, of course you get, I did so many shows, like one year at 97, I did 11 shows that year. And because sometimes I'm so regimented on dieting and that off-season, sometimes I was too relaxed. I might have breakfast and then I might have lunch. And then I might just pick up food. I might have two meals a day in a protein drink. I figured if I was more consistent in my off season and ate regular six meals, I probably could have had a little bit more size. But even myself, I just couldn't be bothered because I'm so regimented contest time. I didn't want to have anything set up. I just wanted to eat when I wanted to eat and do whatever. But I still trained hard, but I could have been a bit more consistent off season myself. And what I'm seeing now, sadly, too, you know, how everyone don't, goes on don't about run over that. Don't run over that because I hope everybody heard that. And I agree mm -hmm. that it's hard to stay motivated and consistent off season. When you got a show, mm -hmm. it's different. I get that. But if yeah. there's something he just said, it's if he could have done just a little better off season, he could have been a little bit better for the show. And it's a hard yeah. thing to do. Continue, continue. Because I want you to kind of talk to them and I explain to them how can the individual be – on precise when they're off season because it's a it sucks. Well, it you know, does. But it it we're eating, you know. Mm -hmm. How do you get motivated? Well, I think we still just found that I've started doing a bit more cardio because in the off season, you know, I like to eat big meals, and you know, when you're eating clean food, you can have a meal and 20, 30 minutes later you're starving again because there's no fats in it. So sadly. You know, some of my famous off-season meals could be some Kentucky. <laughs> it's like if I eat Kentucky chicken, the fat in Kentucky That's chicken, right. I could eat that at lunchtime, and I'm still bloated come 6 o'clock at night, so I don't eat till then because my stomach's still bloated. So yeah. it's just a matter of picking foods that wouldn't bloat me up too much. So if I had have eaten, that, like I said, a little bit of junk and good in between, I would have been a lot better. But like I said, if I had a big meal like that, that's the reason I wouldn't eat again for hours later because I'm still full and the stomach still feels bloated. Or I love milk products, even though I shouldn't have them. But if I drank a liter of milk, I wouldn't eat again for maybe two or three hours. And it's like, oh, I'm still bloated and stuff like that. So I knew that, like I said, I could have been a lot more. I, I, some days I'd work out my off season because you could eat like it's almost like, say, you know, when you're eating clean all the time and you think to yourself, I've got a cheat day coming up. I'd have a cheat day. And I'm like, I'm going to eat this. I'm going to eat that. And let's just say I'm dieting on three and a half thousand calories of good, clean food. On my cheat day, I've got all the stuff in my mind I'm going to eat. I might go have a big thing of pancakes and then I'm bloated. And then I might eat again later and have a burger. And then I'm bloated again. Then, then it's dinner time. And I'm like, shit, this was my cheat day. And I've only had about 2000 calories. I've eaten less than I would have eaten if I was eating my clean food. It's just that yeah. because you've changed the fatty foods and sodium loaded foods, you just go Bleh, and you blow it up so much that, you know, it's, it's a different type of food. But I'm eating less calories of junk. I would have eat, been better off just eating the cleaner food and get more calories into me. So, 
Yeah, so I, I, we, we are living the same life, you and I, uh, in that sense. It's, it's exactly that. You're so hungry because you've been dieting. It's a cheat day. Mm-hmm. And then you start out with something like that and you're just bloated for the next six hours. You're like, shoot, I just yeah. killed the whole day. And then you're like, and you're like, oh, the cheat day is almost over. I've got to try and ram all this food in before I go to sleep. <laughs> what do you think is today's society on not wanting to? So you talked about milk. You talked about these products that maybe you feel you shouldn't do. So mm-hmm. for me right now, to give you an eyesight, is I am doing the milks. I am doing uh, a lot of oils, um, carbohydrates. Mm-hmm. I'm eating. I'm feeding the body, but not just the body. I'm trying to feed the connective tissue to just mm-hmm. heal the body. Because I did kind of what you did, where you competed those eleven shows. That is so destructive to the body. People don't mm-hmm. realize you're in a deficit. You're in a deficit for so long. You're doing dry outs. You're you're, you're killing yourself to peak, and then a couple weeks later, you got to peak again, and it's just you're hurting the body. And I did that with my incredible diet in the last couple of years. And so I'm uh-huh. really taking my time this time, this off season, and just going until the body kicks in, until the body utilizes that 5,000 calories, until the body doesn't feel sluggish. I'm going to stay with this and keep feeding it until it heals. And what I'm finding is that I'm starting to come out of that. Now it took three months. Mm-hmm. It took three months for my body to heal from the damage I did to it from dieting so hard. And the strength and everything is getting stupid. And I can't wait till you get here because we're going to lift. But I think I might be the strongest I've ever been, even more than the early 90s. I'll be over there on the machines like the rehab workout. How you going, Mike? Good. Keep lifting. Keep going. <laughs> but um, hold on. Let me just change the pin from 20 to 30 pounds. I'm going heavy today. <laughs> how do you think we can teach these people that there's there's a nice balance to food where you shouldn't be in a deficit all the time. You shouldn't trying to be 365. I'm cutting, I'm cutting, I'm cutting all year. I don't think mm-hmm. they understand what they could do to their body, especially yeah, later on. It's that, it's, that, it's, that, it's that fine line, especially in the off season where, you know, cause I go from one extreme to the other because I didn't care. So I ate too much, but it's like, you don't want to get as big as I did, but you still want to have enough where, like I said, a lot of people I find even in the off season, they might think they're eating a lot of food, but still, they're just eating enough to maintain what they have. It's almost like you've got to eat that little bit more. It might only be 800 calories extra a day because you've got to go over to really make sure you're not missing out on any nutrients or proteins and stuff like that. But sometimes if you go too far, like I used to, you go and get really big. So it's that fine line to knowing basically how many calories you roughly need and then maybe just go on 800, 1,000 over that, which isn't really much if you're adding if you're five, six meals a day. If you just had 200 calories extra to each meal, whatever, it's not really much. It could just be, you know, another cup of rice here or another piece of chicken breast on this meal. So it's easy to add that extra thousand and that might be all you need. But like I said, you want to have more calories because most people I see are on that either borderline of enough calories just to maintain or they're actually under. Because like I said, they're doing what I did. They'll have a meal and then because you feel full, you might not eat for four hours. So at the end of the day, you're like, I've only had three meals today. You add up the calories, it might be only 1,800 calories when you died on 3,000 calories. So, right. you know. Right. Why not do what he did? Why not do what he did? Because he said he used to blow up. but Right. But Well, you can. Of- you can do what I did, but I'd go to the far extreme. Like if I could, I used to compete at what? Most I competed was 218. 206 was my best, but I'd, I'd weigh sometimes 280 in the off season. So, you know, I'm like 70 odd pounds over contest weight and, Hey, there I am. Look at that. That's a plate of Kentucky there. Woo. Is that Robert Reef? Is that a shoot with Robert Reef? Uh, yeah, that was I uh, forget who did that. Could have been Irvin. That was for the before and afters for muscle tech where they like really push the stomach out, Lee here yeah. and do that sort of thing. So I'm like, they're like, we'll give you ten thousand dollars to do these photos. I'm like, I would have done it for free. I get fat every off season. <laughs> so, but the thing is though, and that's the illusion. There I'm about two seventy. And when you see the transformation picture, I weigh about 210. And it, like I said, it's such an illusion. There I just look like a fat pig. You go, I don't know what he weighs. When you see him side by side at 210, I look twice as big and muscular as I do at 270. It's like somebody just did a video and I'm sitting there dying. He shows a gladiator photo of me. Mm-hmm. And gladiators, I was in battle dumb. I'm 285, 295. 
um, and he showed a photo of me doing uh, this sliced photo. That, um, I won't say that I'm what my weight is, but I'm sliced. And he's like, mm -hmm. you can't go from this, from gladiators, maybe 215 to this size at 230. And he's just like crushed the numbers. I'm almost 300 in gladiators. Uh -huh. It doesn't look like much. And I'm 257 in the, in the ripped photo. And I'm like, it plays an illusion. So you there next to you mm -hmm. sliced, everybody's going to go, oh, you sliced, you're bigger. And you're 60 pounds mm -hmm. smaller. Yeah, that would happen to me all the time because people would see me in the gym being bulked up like that. And I'd start getting ready for a show. I'd start leaning up. And they go, oh, shit, Lee, you've put some size on. You're looking bigger. I'm like, I've lost 35 pounds. They're like, what? You look bigger. You know, because the, the muscle thing? starts coming out. You get the definition. And it's like, it's, like I said, my arm, when I was bulked up, would be 24 inches. When I was in contest shape, it was 21. But even at 21, ripped, it looked like it was still 24. It's like, you've seen it. I've seen guys in the gym who might just have an 18-inch arm, but got the beautiful bicep, tricep shaped and styrated. Their arm looks 20. If you say, fuck, your arm's 20 inches, just cause it a shape and definition. Yeah. It's like, how many times you see movie actors on the big screen, like the Van Dams and Stallones, you think they're massive because they're in shape, but you see them in person, you're like, fuck, he's tiny. But, you know, it's like. That's the truth. It's funny because I've lived all the stuff that you're saying. It's like when you first start the diet, it's great because mm -hmm. you still got that size, but then the shape oh, comes out and everybody oh, goes, don't, don't, oh, what God, about that? Huge. What about that in between stage where? Like I said, I love to be big and bulked where you're strong. I start dieting, and now I'm not big and bulked. I'm not ripped. I'm in this in-between stage where I got a little definition here, but my waist is still fat. So you're sort of soft and spudgy in place. I said, that's the bit where it fucks with your mind. It's like, shit, do I just go and eat again and go back to being bulked, or do I just pay that look in the mirror and push through it? Because once you get through it, then everything starts coming in. But that... That in-between stage where everything just looks soft and you're like, oh, Jesus. So that's the <laughs> crossroad. Let's say that that's the crossroad. Uh -huh. A lot of these people that are watching today are in that crossroad. Mm -hmm. They've been moderately dieting or they've been dieting and they're getting to this point and they can go either right or left. Do I uh -huh. keep dieting or do I go off season? Mm -hmm. Is there something that's going to be a tough question because it's it. It's going to make you really dig on this one. What would make you go to the right to keep dieting? What would make you go to the left to go off season? Not for you, particularly you, but mm -hmm. for you, if you were coaching somebody, what would you tell them mm -hmm. if you can, if this is a, it's a tough well, question. I'd be, like, I'd be like, listen, like, it's like, how long you've, have you been off season? You know, if you came to me, you want change. I'm going to make you have change. You know, you've been this way your whole time. And yes, because I've been through it, I know how, you know, how it is to go like this, but I'd tell people, look, going back to how you were off season is too easy. You could just go and have a couple of meals in a few days and you're back to that. I said, look, mentally, yes, it's going to be hard. That's why I always tell people physically when I got ready for shows, dieting, the cardio, the training was easy. The mental side was the hardest you're ever going to go through. The mental aspect where your mind's going to play games. You've probably known it too. Where Even when you're in shape some days at the gym, you could look in the mirror and go, I look like fucking shit. And people go, what are you talking about? It's just like, it's almost like these yeah, for a anorexia. Because these, my team's here and, and, and you guys understand that now because they'll go, you look good. And I'm like, I look like shit. And they're like, dude, mm -hmm. you look really, really good. And it does. It mm -hmm. messes with your mind. So everybody at home. <laughs> and you're like, and you're like, you're just saying that because you're my friend. You're just saying that. <laughs> you're you're good. paying you. But uh -huh. you're, 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 you're listening to a legend of the health and fitness world tell you that it freaks with your mind mm -hmm. you understand for you you average joes that have your job and your family and stuff you're listening to a, a legend of the industry telling you it messed with even him and it messes with me and so don't feel bad that it messes with your mind when you do get mm -hmm. to that oh yeah and we're all gonna we're all gonna get to that point and this is where i said it just be strong and keep going because it might only be two weeks you're at that point where you look at yourself i just stopped looking at myself because like i said the upper body around the delts and arms might be tightening up, but the waist is still flabby. So it's like, oh, I look good here. I look soft here. So it's like, I don't want to even look. And generally it's only like two weeks and then you'll notice it all coming in. And then you feel, fuck, I'm glad I stuck with it. I push through. And once you get past that, it just seems like 
you know, I'd go to bed, you know, I say the power of the mind. I'd lay in bed as dumb as it sounds to put myself to sleep. I'd be like, I am getting more ripped. I am getting more shredded. My skin's getting thinner. Like this mantra I just keep saying in my head over and over. And when I was married to Cappy at the time, I'd just say this, I'm getting tighter. It's getting tighter here. And like I'd picture it in my mind, the abs coming in, the waist coming in. And every couple of days she's like, you look to be changing all the time. And it's something to be said, you know, if you can see it in your mind and stuff and you believe it, that mentally it will start happening because once you see it start happening, like I said, you get past that tough two weeks and you look in the mirror, all of a sudden you're like, oh, shit, my waist is coming. The excitement comes back. You're like, yeah, I'm getting in shape. So when you go back to the gym, you're training harder. Your cardio is getting harder. And week by week, you just seem to be getting in shape. So, you know, it's going to be hard. But once you get through that, trust me, it's worth it in the end. Even if they're not getting, like I said, not everyone's going to go into contest shape, but just for the average person who wants to just feel better about themselves and get into some decent type of shape, you know, just to go from how they were to looking, you know, good and feeling good, you know, it's going to be hard on your mind. And like I said, it's too easy to go back to that. Just yeah. stick it out. And like I said, generally, it's just that two weeks max at the top where it just seems to nothing's happening. You might even hop on the scale and go, oh, fuck, even the scales aren't moving. Why am I even bothering? And that's where it starts playing with your mind because I'm dieting hard. I'm doing the cardio hard. But it's almost like your body just plateaus for two weeks to fuck with you. The test you have to say, okay, which way are you going to go? And if you get through that, then it will start dropping off again. Let me ask you another question. How long is too long to diet and get into that and, 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 and do the two hours of cardio or the hour of cardio? Oh. Or, mm -hmm. And then, then and what do you mean? Oh, oh, it's too long in the off season. Oh, okay. Good, good question. Um, so answer, ask, I'm asking you that one first. How long is too long to diet down for? Well, I think like I'll do a 12 to 16 weeks for a contest and, you know, at a contest, you look your best, but you feel your worst because being that lean, as good as it looks, it's not healthy. But right. to the average person, if you're, like I said, I don't even like to call it dieting because, yes, we go on a strict diet for a contest, but for the average person who wants to get in shape and look a bit decent, I just call it, you know, it's just really healthy eating, making the right changes and choices. And once you get that going, and I said, and you do your cardio, even if you're only doing 45 minutes a day walking your dog or morning and afternoon walking the dog. It doesn't have to be in a gym killing yourself. Like I'm not one of those guys that goes crazy. I just get on the treadmill, a good steady pace on an incline, or I'll go walking outside. And like I said, but if you're eating healthy and clean, once you get to that point where you're like, you know what, I look good, I'm happy with where I am, you can still eat clean. And as you know, if you're doing the cardio consistently, if you go out for dinner and you feel like, hey, you know what, I want a piece of chocolate cake, you can have it. Don't be like, oh no, I can't eat that. You can have that and trust me, one piece of chocolate cake, at a meal once a week or if you go out one night and go, you know what, tonight's the night, I'm going to have a pizza. Trust me, when you first do it, you think, oh, bad, this is bad food, I can't eat it. You beat yourself up mentally, but trust me, the next day you're going to look exactly the same. Yes, if you did it every day, you're going to put a bit of weight back on. But, you know, you can have a little treat here and there and not feel guilty about it. And now there's certain treats that are lower in sugar and lower in fat that, you know, you can have that as long as your main diet, though, is still healthy. And like I said, not bodybuilding diet because we go, far extreme for a bodybuilding diet but just overall healthy eating if you're eating healthy you can have a little treat here and there so like i said it's unrealistic to think you can only eat chickens and salads and you can't have this and can't have that because you know anyone that sort of deprives himself for a long time if you just had a little bit you're satisfied you can get through the week again if you have that in you know, a little cheat meal on a saturday night you have your pizza and whatever a bit of chocolate cake come sunday monday you're good for the week Whereas if you just have nothing at all, once you get to that point, like I said, when, when it builds up and you go to have something, you explode and go <laughs> go right off the rails because you deprived it for so long. Because sometimes you might just need that little bit just to keep you sane. It's like, I just want a little bit. I just want to taste. Have it. Once you get to that point where you're happy with how you're looking. Like I said, because you don't want to be miserable. I said, you want to diet. You want to look good, but feel good and still have fun. You don't want to be like, oh, fuck, I hate the world. I hate you. You go out for dinner and you're sitting there eating and go, oh, fuck yeah. you, I hope you choke on that. It's like, you know, it's like you don't want to be one of those miserable people where you look good, but you just, you know, shit to be around because, oh, fuck, he's on a diet again. He's too miserable. <laughs> then um, my team here is, uh, they're youngsters. And so they're they're in that stage of wanting to compete uh, mm -hmm. one day, but they don't want to compete moderately. They want to. They want to make names for themselves. They want to step on mm -hmm. there and be impressive. Um, so how long is maybe too long 
to bulk up for or off season? Well, I always find that, you know, my off seasons would always be based on whatever show I did. So if I did like the Ironman and the, which was February and early March was the Ironman and Arnold Classic, and I qualify for Olympia, I'd be good till what if I started dieting the end of June. So that would be my bulk up time. But then if I did the March show Arnold, then I did a show in May, whatever time that was, it might only be two and a half months off season. So it just depended on what shows I planned on doing. But yeah, you know, it just gets to a point too where some people are like, I want to put more size on, I want to put more size on. So they go a year or two without doing so. It's like you got to get to a point where, okay, you might want to be bigger, but you know, after a year of bulking, if you've got a little bit of muscle, just diet down, do a show, get your feet wet, see how you look, experience the dieting and everything. And then, you know, you pick a show six months later, go off for, you know, two and a half months, three months of just eating a lot more food and put a bit of size on. Because sadly now, you know, we're seeing all these deaths in bodybuilding and yeah. people, as soon as there's a death, they're like, steroids, steroids. And I'm like, okay, steroids probably play a part. But then I'm also thinking now, a lot of these guys, like I said, when we competed, yeah, we took gear, but probably not like a lot of guys do now, but we would do like the shows beginning of the year, middle of the year, end of the year. And I'm thinking if you weigh it up now, it's like, okay, we used a bit of gear, but even though you use gear for contests, contest time, cardio, you're pretty fit because you're doing lots of cardio. You're eating a lot cleaner. So, you know, your body, you know, fats and everything's probably functioning a lot better compared to guys now They do one show a year they're sitting around 300 pounds for 10 months of the year, pumping gear into them. I'm like, really, which is worse for you? You know, it's like, we don't know what amount of steroids is bad, but yet if you're 300 pounds, because, you know, bodybuilders off season, it's like, you want to go somewhere? No, I'm not going for a walk. I could burn muscle. You want to go out? No, I got to sit here. I just go to the gym, sit on the couch and stuff myself full of food and take gear. So, you know, on the body, that's a strain on the heart. You're not, you're not cardio fit, but if you did more shows, you know, you're doing a lot more cardio. You're still using a little bit of gear, yes, but you're doing a lot more cardio. You're eating super clean. So technically that should be better for your body. But kids now are just doing one show a year. I'm thinking, do a few more shows. And the thing is, too, you don't need these vast amount of gear that I hate seeing young kids taking. Well, I read online such and such. It's all fucking rumors. It's all bullshit. That's why I get so annoyed when I'm from day one. I've been truthful with the amount. And people go, you're lying. I heard you take this. I'm like, I'm the guy taking it. I know what I fucking take. I'm telling you the amount I take. Well, such and such said, did take this. I said, well, such and such, I don't know him. So how the hell would he know what I'm taking? It's like, <laughs> it's like you asked me, I'll tell you. And the thing is, too, I've helped kids who have been on this large amount. I said, look, go off clean, four or five months off everything, go back on. And they've gone back on probably using a quarter and competed. They've looked better. They've felt better. I said, look, it just proves you did not need that large amount. So I said, the large amount's good for the guy you're buying it off he'll be up driving a new fucking Mercedes and shit because you're buying 10 bottles of this when you only need two bottles. That's all you need. Oh, no. So let's just get this mentality more is better. And you're probably like me. It's like when we trained, when I had magazines, I knew about steroids, but to me it was just about lifting heavy, eating and drinking the Mega Mass 5000 that looked like fucking wallpaper paste. You could barely get it down. <laughs> and then it was like, to me, even to this day, drugs were the last thing. They were the 5%, but people go, oh, drugs are everything. I said, no, they're not. I said, the training, the eating, your mindset and everything like that, what you have up here is going to outdo any drug that's out there. Because if you have the genetics, I tell someone, you know, we get the ones that come up and say, hey, Mike, I'm going to train. I'm going to be Mr. Olympia. And you're like, mm, okay, good luck. It's like, you know, maybe do a local show first before you hit the Mr. Olympia. That and they say, there. I want to be pro. What do I have to do? I want to be a bodybuilder. What do I have to do? I said, eat correctly and train. I said, trust me, if you have the genetics to be a top bodybuilder, just by eating and training with no drugs, you're going to build a great physique. You'll know this is what you're meant to do. It's like any sport, I guess, some young kid that picks up a basketball or like Tiger Woods when he was young, you're like, hey, shit, that kid's going to be a great golfer. If you have it genetically and God-given talent to be a bodybuilder, like I said, no drugs at all, just training and eating, you're going to build muscle. People are going to think, oh, that guy's on fucking gear just because you have it there already. So when you get to a level, when you do need it, you only need a small amount. So these guys that say, I'm going to be a bodybuilder, and they start pumping their gear in, nothing's happening. Fuck, I'll double the doses, nothing's happening. Years and years go by, and in their head it's like, listen, sadly, not everyone's going to be a bodybuilder. Not everyone can go to the gym and put on muscle. You might go to the gym and get strong, 
that's why I tell people, I don't like hate to break their bubble, but it's like, listen, go to the gym. If it happens, trust me, it'll happen. But if it doesn't happen, still enjoy the training. You can go there still to be healthy. You can go there, still feel good. But, you know, you might not ever put on freaky muscle to be a bodybuilder. It's like me. Say I love basketball. I could be good at basketball and dribble to basketball and shoot hoops, but I'm never going to be in the NBA. It's like you just got to face the facts on, you know, you can only do what your body can allow you to do. And if you can't do it, pumping all the drugs in there, it's like I always said before, if we went around the world, how many sprinters would there be that are super fast? Like, you know, they're quick. But yet they could take all the drugs in the world they're not going to be like a Hussein Bolt or somebody because he's just naturally gifted to be that way. He's built for that. And some people are built for bodybuilding where, like I said, without touching a drug, they can just pick up a weight and go boom. And you're like, wow, look at him. And then other guys can train all they want, pump all the drugs. And we've seen, I've seen the goals when I used to be there. I knew so many guys that would train their ass off and be strong, take all the drugs. But if I said to you, hey, see him, he's on all this gear, you'd be like, fuck, does he even lift weights? But in their mind, if I take more, if I take more, I can look like you. But sadly, it doesn't I happen think, like that. See, that's a good thing. You and I have been around this sport our entire lives. And mm -hmm. it's funny because, you know, I've been at Gold's Venice now for over 30 years. And I've seen these guys come in there. And I've seen guys just go from nothing to something massive. And it's not because of the amount of drugs. They're not taking much. And it's not about the weights they're lifting. They're not lifting a lot. But it's just genetically their body absorbs, mm -hmm. utilizes. Yeah. And I've seen other guys come into the gym, lift a tremendous amount of weight, and get on a sheesh load of gear. And it just looks worse and worse and worse and worse. Uh -huh. <laughs> until they quit, until they, mm -hmm. they blow out their, you know. And it's like people don't really comprehend that. They think it's pretty much you get your mail kit. Hey, got my drugs. I'll eat better, I'll lift, and I'm just going to be Mr. Olympia. Yeah. And it's just not even yeah. close to that. Yeah. And so, sadly, too, they're the ones, like I said, you you get it all the time. I always laugh every time I see an article pop up. Is Michael Hearn natural? I'm like, oh, fuck me dead. I figured if you if you pricks worried about if Michael Hearn's natural as much as you did yourself, you might look decent yourself because you're so worried <laughs> about what other people are doing. And it's like, look at your photos from when you were young to now, the consistency over all those years. You had the muscle when you were younger. You had the muscle in your 20s, 30s, 40s, and now your 50s. The muscle is there. It hasn't been like you went from in your 20s to looking like Rami in your 40s where, oh, shit, he's got on the gear. They don't realize just the consistency in eating. And you've got genetics. You can see it in your family. That just that consistency over all the years, you can keep that muscle. But these are the guys, like we mentioned, who go to the gym. They pump all the gear in. After a year or two, oh, nothing's happening. I'm not even as big as Mike O'Hearn. I'm taking all this. So... If I'm taking all these drugs and I'm not as big as him, he's got to be on a shitload because I can't do it. So he can't do it. Them, right? He's like, that's their, that's their mindset. <laughs> Question for you then, because you're in your, your 40s now, right? You haven't hit 50 yeah. yet. 50 in uh, July. 50 in July. So question, and this is something I've been really researching and trying to understand, and there's no research for it because there's nobody that's done what you and I have done, and that is consistently lift or lift heavy. Um, mm -hmm. for that many decades, I started, my first powerlifting meet was at 14 and mm -hmm. I, you know, me, I've never, and that's the funniest thing about, which is great about golds is that I've never lifted light, never wanted to, yeah. cause I, cause I like the battle and it's, mm -hmm. it's just the thing within me. I like heavy, I like lifting, but I've also tried to figure out how my joints have stayed so freaking healthy. To mm -hmm. where most guys you and I know that lift heavy have a maximum span of 10 years and they're done. Mm -hmm. Their shoulders yeah, are oh. back, everything is blown out. So my question to you is rep range. And not mm -hmm. rep range to be Lee Priest walking on stage at 24 at the Mr. Olympia. Not that rep range. Rep range that maybe would have got you there, but would have made you through the years – to stay healthier if that was ever an issue, mm -hmm. elbows, shoulders, knees, back, yeah. anything like that. Yeah, I never, I never did the power, I don't know powerlifting or, you know, if you're going into powerlifting event, you're going for singles. And I know a lot of bodybuilders who go super heavy for singles or twos or threes. The minimum I ever did was six reps. I was, I was, I was never interested in going for a personal best because to me, if I was going into powerlifting, sure, but as a bodybuilder, do I want to risk going for one and tearing a peck or, 
10 and a quad or something. So I'd always, the lowest I'd go would be six reps, six to eight for mass building on upper body. Legs, but don't you know, legs I trained with Tom. But well, don't, don't confuse these people because you lifted seven wheels on squats. You did 200-pound dumbbells on inclines. So when, mm -hmm. when they're hitting you, you didn't do powerlifting. Trust me, everybody, this man lifted just as much weight as a powerlifter. He just did more reps. Mm -hmm. And the thing is, too, but I find, and I said even doing legs, like, you know, you're trained with Tom Platts. We could go into the 50s up to 100 reps with Tom sometimes, yep. just stupid amounts. And, you know, I was very instinctive, too, with weights and reps. I just went by how I feel. But I think, you know, look, I've seen lots of your training videos. And the main key, I think, is, too, you never use sloppy form. Neither did I. People watch my videos and go, these just like textbook and machine. I would go heavy, but every rep would still be nice and smooth. There was no jerking. There was no bending. There was no swinging. Everything I did was totally controlled. I wouldn't drop down and then bounce out. I wouldn't drop a bar and try bounce it up. Two on curls when I curled the free plates. I just stood here. Because the weight was heavy, I just sort of had to lean back a bit to counterbalance it. But there was no swinging like this. It's like, And that's where I see now a lot of young kids because, you know, Branch and them have trained a certain way, but then when Branch and them do videos or Ronnie does videos, they've got all that muscle. So, yes, they use bad form. They're jerking and this and that. But I've seen young kids, oh, what, lightweight, lightweight like Ronnie, and they're throwing the T-bar, jerking their backs like this. And you figure, you know, if you train like that, you're going to get problems. So I think form is a, you know, you got to have great form. And like I said, yes, it's good to lift heavy weights, but, why lift heavy weights if you're using your body to move it? You know, you want to use the muscle to use it. And like I said before, if you are going to cheat, like I said, if you're doing a barbell curl like this, if I got to here, I might just lean a little bit just to curl it up, but I'm not swinging it. I said, if you're going to cheat, I always said, just cheat a little to add stress to the muscle, not take it away because we could all lift heavy weights and just throw it around to go, look at me, look at all the weight on, but it's, you're just moving it by momentum. You're not really, you know, the muscle's not really contracting and you're not feeling it, so... It's crazy, but I'm sure like when I did the seven plates, I still did it controlled, but yet if I was to go five plates and really squeeze my quads, I feel the five plates more. It's like sometimes on a yep. leg press, we could load that thing up, but you're more focused on, I don't want this fucker to squash me, so you're just concentrating on pushing it. If I halve that, then I'm more focused on squeezing the quad, contracting the quad. I get more of a burn and pump on generally a lighter weight because I'm more into the muscle. I'm thinking about the muscle. I'm not thinking about... Fuck, just push this up so it doesn't kill me. So <laughs> I love that it, you're you're an echo of what I've been saying. And I love that because of the fact that um, I stopped powerlifting in my early 20s because I powerlifted for about a decade. But when I got gladiators the first time, I realized that that strength didn't translate. Mm -hmm. And I was like, that pissed me off. You know, and I'm like, I got rid of the belts, the knee wraps, the sleeves. I slowed it down. I said, there's no reason to move fast through the exercise. Because then it's just momentum and that, yeah. that speed that's lifting it. And it's not like what you did when you were squatting or, or using the 200-pound dumbbells. And I love that we all did those 200-pound dumbbells because that was like a measuring that we all had fun mm -hmm. between <laughs> talk and smack. How many are you going to get? How many are you going to get? And then Chris would go or flex and you. And, and I remember I remember the first time I come to Golds almost and my friend Kurt, he's like, oh, it is Billy Smith and Jim Quinn were in yep. the gym you know, because they were always going heavy crazy. And he goes, I'll introduce you to him. I went down there and he just went, oh, hi. And they blew me off. And it was a week later. I was there doing chest down the far end with the big dumbbells. And I'm just squeezing. I had the 180s at the time. I'm just repping them out nice and slow. I put them down. Then they both walked over and go, wow, that's impressive. So from that point on, they talked to me. It was almost like I had to earn their respect before they would talk to me. So if you guys don't know who Billy Smith or Jim Quinn was, Billy Smith was thunder with me on a lot mm -hmm. of gladiators. But he was also a top-ranked. Uh, national competitor and Jim Quinn was uh, actually played fullback for the Jets. But yeah. was, uh, these guys both were six two, six three, three hundred pound monsters. Crazy and strong. Stage, <laughs> these guys were about two hundred and eighty five pound monsters, but both lifted <laughs> tremendous. We we used to mm -hmm. uh, on the leg press, we would stack the leg press and then take an Olympic bar and stack those on top to put more 45s mm -hmm. on. And then, and then sometimes I'd see Billy sitting on top of that. <laughs> yeah. So these guys were massive. And I, I love the fact that you picked up the same dumbbells that they were trying to use and, and you rep it like that. Um, mm -hmm. Talking and about. I said, once I did that, I sort of I earned their respect from that day on. So they'd always talk to me. How you going, Lee? And this and that. So 
for the first time we're just like oh who's this little prick from australia piss off us <laughs> you saw that uh the video of him posing the one you showed me i'd like them to see that we're gonna we're gonna see if we can throw this video up because i want the fans to see this it's just it shows the difference between that era and today mm -hmm. um if he, if he can make this happen. Well, like I said, I just, like I said, I know you, you, you bow it off, but like I said, it just annoys me when, you know, people say to me the drugs and that, but I know you get a lot more because when you say, oh, look, I'm natural, I've been natural my whole life, people go, oh, fuck off. It's like, do these people understand if they did what half of what you did, even 15, 10 years of consistency, and I mean consistent, it's not like you said you go hard for a month or two, then you take a couple of weeks. I mean, it's like week after week after week, day after day, year after year, eating, training, eating, training. Even when I go on holidays, I'd find the gym and train. There was no off time for me. And even now, I've been training like over 30, coming on 35 years. It's like, if I was to add up, you know, yeah, we travel the world. So maybe let's just say you're traveling for a day, you can't get to a gym or I've been sick and I've had to go to the hospital for an operation. And then even then I had, when I had this arm in a sling for three months, I still trained this side. I was doing legs every day. I just couldn't move this arm. So I still did it. The doctor said, take a month off. I'm, and I think I took four days off and I'm back in the gym. It's like, if I add up, I said, I was trying to work out the other day, just from traveling, being sick, or something's come up and I couldn't get to the gym. Over that 35 years, if I add up every day that I had off, it'd probably be eight to nine months total in that whole 35 years, if I add up every day that I just, I couldn't get to the gym or just from being sick or traveling around the world. So people don't understand, you know, nine months out of 35 years, if you add up every day off, that's not much really. So it's like, you know, it's just got to have that consistency and do it all the time. That's why these people, I think they sell themselves short because they could be a lot better themselves. They're looking for this out. They're looking for that shortcut saying, yeah, well, I could do it if I took drugs. You don't need drugs. Just use your fucking mindset. Get in the gym. Bust your ass day after day after day. Don't, like I said, do it one week. Then go, oh, I'm too tired this week. My legs are sore. I'm not going back and shit like that. You've got to go back and over and over again. I would think shows like, when I thought shows like The Biggest Loser and stuff mm -hmm. would show the world what is feasible if you just lock yourself down and, and put the effort in. Yeah. And so grab some photos then if you can't do the video. Uh, and, and, it, and it didn't. It, it, I thought it would. I thought that would show. And it's like the one thing that I love about I have this Titan crew and it's individuals um, that are like minded, you know, that mm -hmm. we understand we have to do the work. Um, there's no there's no coddling them. I tell mm -hmm. them like it is, I, I put them on the plans. I say, this is what we're going to do. You're going to have this much time. And there's things that I won't let them do. If they've dieted too long or been in a deficit too long, I don't want them to hurt their body. So I'll bring them out yeah. of that. Um, and, you know, but I'll push them. I'll push them as hard as you and I trained back in the day. And I tell mm -hmm. these guys, you guys are training as hard as Olympian competitors. Mm -hmm. uh, and they love it. And they love it. And they change. And I've got... In, you know this we've we've helped enough people to see guys going from 350 down to 200 pounds it's like it's mm -hmm. cool to see that yeah and it's cool to change their lives like that and i wish more people would just listen to what you're mm -hmm. saying about oh, yeah. well it's, well, I've always found too the it's lifting yeah, it's the first, and that's system. the thing the first thing they got to change before they change their dieting before they change their body their training the first thing they got to change is their mindset mindset is everything if you don't have the right mindset you're going to be stuffed from the beginning. If you've got some bit of negativity when it comes to training or you're thinking this person's only looking that way because of drugs and shit, you're not going to go anywhere because you're putting these limitations on yourself, these negative thoughts where, you know, you shouldn't have it there. It's like if you're going to go into something, get your mind right, think, okay, this is going to be hard. It's not going to be easy because, like we said, if it was easy, everyone would do it and everyone would be in shape and everyone would be looking great. But so I said it's going to be hard, but once you do get there, it's going to be worth it. You're going to feel better in yourself and like i said you don't have to go crazy like i said a contest diet totally different but just for well-being the average person wanting to feel good about themselves maybe had years that are life bring down their cholesterol lose kilos off themselves you know there's a lot of people out there who have got children who can't experience all the great things with their children yeah. because they're too overweight they just don't have the energy so they're tired and run down and stuff like that just changing your life will change everything it just make you happier all around and yes i know 
well, not coming down and overweight, but there are some overweight people who, if you ran their bloods and that, they are healthy. I've got friends that are overweight and they could probably outrun me because they're still athletic. But, you know, I'm talking about the ones that get the obesity side, the morbidly obese. And, you know, it's sad now that, like I said, because some overweight people can be healthy, but then the majority of them, a lot of them aren't healthy. A lot of them, like I said, they're in, insides, their blood work's not good. They just sit around and stuff. And But yet, so, sadly, now of society, if you mention that, you're fat shaming, you're this, you're that. It's like, you know, healthy people, I remember... I used to see anyone in shape, and I'd see overweight people look at healthy people and be like, I, I said, I think healthy people, people in shape, actually get shame more than what overweight people do because I'd see somebody overweight to me. If you're happy, you're happy. It doesn't bother me. But yet they would say shit about me because I'm in shape and stuff. They'd be like, oh, that looks disgusting. Oh, that's terrible. <laughs> or steroids or this or that. Like I can't walk past you and go, oh, fucking pizza. Go have some more Kentucky. Or oh, you're fat shaming. It's like, well, why can you say shit about me? Because I'm in shape. It's like, yeah, it's, we're, we're disgusting. Hey, let's throw up a couple of photos here for the fans. I'd like them to see this. Throw up something here. Oh, that Jeez. was 1997, two weeks before the Mr. Olympia at Long Beach. Oh. And I, there, there, my arms were still 21, but I think I weighed 97. I think I was only around 197 pounds there. And I placed fifth, but then got moved to sixth place in my first Olympia. Jeez Louise. Go throw up I was meant to do the Olympia three years before that. It would have been one of the youngest, but I got suspended. Fancy that, me getting suspended. <laughs> Why did you get suspended? What year was this? Oh, you know, I just would have my say about how the bodybuilders were treated and mm -hmm. the powers that be didn't like that. <laughs> that was from the Iron Man show one year. All right. All right. Throw another. Look at that. Oh, that was, was that the same year, 97? Uh, yeah, that was a Flex magazine shoot with Chris yeah. Lund down at Club Metrics, I oh, think. You can see that. No, I think that was the cover of a Flex magazine also. See if you find an early, early 90s. See if you got a Gold's Gym photo of this man. The early yeah. ones was when I was 20 would be in the black and white spandex that Irvin Gilt took. That was 2006 when I won the Iron Man. And then got suspended for life. <laughs> <laughs> so tell us, tell us what happened there. Uh, I went to compete in the PDI, which Wayne started the PDI, where I'm going to judge more on symmetry again. Right. And the IPB is like, you can't do that. I said, well, why not? I said, you don't have any shows on. I just won the Ironman and that. This show's on this time of the year. It's like a month before the Olympia. I'll be in shape. Why can't I do it? Because I can make extra money. I said, yeah. it's not taking nothing away from you. I said, in the contract, it says, we're independent contractors. I pay my 275 a year for my pro card. So it's like, it'd be different if the IPV was paying me a monthly salary to be with them. I'd be like, okay, right. I'm with you. But you're not. So I said, I'm going to go compete. So they suspended me for a year and they had another show to do in England. They said, look, Lee, we'll cut the year back if you don't go to England. I said, well, I'm on the poster. People have brought tickets. I'm sorry, I've got to go. Well, we'll give you two years. I'm like, well, give me two years. That's okay. So I got the two-year suspension, but then I was going through their rule book where if you're a convicted felon, I was just marking off all this shit. I said, okay, you said what I did broke the rules. I competed in a different federation. I said, then I brought up all these names. I said, well, such and such, he's a convicted felon. He's still competing, and he's such and such. He's done this. The pornography, if I go online, I can find him doing pornographic stuff. I said, so let's just say I'm a mother, and my young kid wants to get into bodybuilding, and they bring up this bodybuilder's name. Let's look him up. Oh, my God, he's doing pornography stuff. Oh, and let's look up this guy. He's a convicted felon. Oh, you want to be like Lee Priest? Let's look up Lee Priest. What's he ever done? Oh, he's just competed. Oh, you competed in this organization. I said, so what looks worse for the organization, what they've done or what I've done? And because I argued the point, and then I went on, um, I had VPX radio show with John Romano, and we'd just talk about the politics in the sport, good and bad. You know, if something was good, we'd mention it. If something was bad, we'd say, okay, the politics should be taken out, this and that. And because we did that, they said your two-year suspension now is a lifetime ban. <laughs> Stepping, looking at this now, because I, I look back at the shows I won, and it, it was it was the – I appreciate them because uh, it gave me something to shoot for. It gave me a goal, and I mm -hmm. became the best – guy there was in the world okay cool but at this stage it doesn't mean do, do you wish you hadn't have done that no yeah no, because that wouldn't have been no that wouldn't have been me because people always said lee why didn't you keep your mouth shut 
And my mum was always, I think on one of the documentaries, I'm doing a new documentary now, but my mum was always like, Lee Ford, he could change the world. He thought he could right the wrongs. And, you know, I was always brought up, always tell the truth, don't lie. So, you know, that's why when I, people ask me a question, I tell the truth. Some like it, some don't. It's like, hey, it's just who I am. And I think if I wasn't like that, it wouldn't have been me. I'm not the type of person who, like I said, I think if you go on YouTube, you can find it at the 2003 press conference where I'm sitting there and, I'm arguing with Wayne almost because he's talking. Because I said, look, it's not right that we have the Mr. Olympia, the Super Bowl of contests, and guys who place out of the top 10 don't get a dollar. I said, everyone should get money. And Wayne's like, put it in writing. Uh, and, he, and I said, I knew you were going to say that. So I stand up at the press conference. I walk up. I go, I've got it in writing. I pull it out of my suit and hand it to him. And he reads it. He goes, okay. So from that day on, everyone got $2,000. It didn't place in the top 10. And it was like things like that, but it's on it's on YouTube. It's funny, people love watching it because Wayne's talking away there. And they go, oh, wait a minute, I have got it. And the crowd's like, oh, stick it up your ass, Wayne. Lee's got the leather road up. So it's things like that where I just didn't think, you know, the athletes were treated fair. So I'd, I'd have to say something. It's even like, you know, people would be like, Lee, stop your complaining. I said, but it's not just me, it's all the other athletes. But yet, you had to say, let's all, let's all stand together. And I turn around and go, hey, guys. I'm like, guys, where, where'd everybody yeah. go? It's like, so even Wayne, Wayne at the well, let me 2002 start San Francisco that I won. There's, I there's, guys today, for there's guys today that still talk, but they don't push the – they don't push against. They only ride no. with is my oh, polite yeah. well, way to um, Well, the thing was in 2002 when I won the San Francisco, an article just come out in MD where I talked about the politics in the sport – where I knew some judges had slept with competitors and said, I don't care how he looks. I'm always going to put him first. So I wrote about it and I walk in because I'm always early to the press, to the athletes meeting. I'm first one in there with Kathy and Wayne's there and he's got the magazine. He goes, Lee, come here. And I, go, I said, yes. He goes, there's this article here, blah, 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 this and that. We got into this shouting match. It's just me and him. And then the other competitors start coming in and it quietens down. I just said to Kathy, man, I'm fucked tomorrow. I shouldn't even compete. He's going to screw me. So I end up doing the show and I won it. And backstage, when I come off stage, Wayne goes, hey, Lee, come here. He goes, are you surprised you won? I said, well, to be honest, Wayne, after the argument we had yesterday, I didn't even think I would place. He goes, no, Lee. He goes, I'll tell you one thing. He goes, I respect you and I like what you say because you say it. He goes, and then in the article, you questioned on why do I do this? He goes, I'll tell you why, because you speak out. He goes, I can suspend you. He goes, but then if I say do this and you don't do it and you're suspended, he goes, I know the other 18 guys are going to do what I say. So that's why I do it. I said, well, at least you're being honest and fair. <laughs> and that's the thing. So I never change. I get guys that came up to me with that article and they'd be like, Lee, we agree with what you're saying in here. That's right on. I'm like, well, why don't you stand with me? Oh, no, I can't do that. We'll get in trouble. I said, no, if I do it, I get in trouble. I said, if we all do it, they can't suspend you all of us. They won't the have a contest. Industry. You change yeah, the industry like, if you did it all together. If you yeah, I said, they, yeah, they won't have a contest without the top guys. I said, what do you think they're going to do? I said, picture the Mr. Olympia. I said to him, if we're at the athletes meeting, and sometimes backstage it could be something simple as we didn't have a bottle of water. And people go, oh, what's a bottle of water? I said, well, when you're at that depleted stage and you're in that mindset, a bottle of water is a big thing backstage at a contest, even as small as it sounds. You know, it's like a major thing. So it's like if we're at the athletes meeting on Friday, the Mr. Olympia Saturday, if all of us guys just said, listen, look, we know you have to make money. That's fine. But yet the athletes, let's make it fair. If we don't get this, this and this tomorrow, we're not walking on stage. What could they do? It's like they've sold out the show. People have come from overseas. The sponsors are there. They're not yeah. going to cancel the show if everyone just stuck together. But no one ever did. And they still complain about it. I'm like, well, you get what you deserve because – you have the power to change it. And I said, I don't mean anything crazy. Just make it fair because we're the ones busting our ass year after year. It's like boxing. You know, when you see the Don Kings making all these fit money and the guys are out there belting themselves in the head, you know, they, they get a lot more money today. But back in the day when, you know, they're killing themselves and here's your little breadcrumbs and the promoter gets this big pot of gold. So. Makes everything. Makes everything. Jeffrey's got another photo here for us. Got a couple good ones, they said. Oh, how old oh, are you here? 15. 15. Kid, that just. And people that, go, oh, what were you taking then? What were you you're, taking? You're so out of your mind here. And the thing <laughs> is there, as good as I look, I probably weighed 
54 kilos there. So what's that in pounds? 54 is average 220. Is it 54 kilos? Not much. 54 kilos. That's tiny. Yeah. That's tiny. The illusion. That's what I'm talking about. The illusion is like 119. 119, he says. Yeah. yeah see? Shredded. Shredded <laughs> to the bone. I was like a greyhound. <laughs> <laughs> you have another one? Yep. That's, that's, that's me. Yeah. That's me at 17, and my mother said if she got in shape, she'd do the, I'd do the couples with her. So my mum was 38 there. She'd only been training eight months when she died down for that show. And we were the first mother and son to compete in the world together and win a title. Look at your shoulder separation into your tries. Jeez, I talk about separation and stuff. And look at that, 17 years old, you and me had the same And I weighed, I weighed 70 kilos there because I was in the lightweight class division. I was like 70, 71 kilos. So still not a lot, but like I said, you can't tell when you look at a photo. It looks great though. But you see also at that stage, you were still natural and your genetics yeah. were just showing what was up. It's funny. Normally there's some photos when I'm 19, I could find them on the internet where beginning of the year at 19 and then the end of the year at 19, when you, when I did Decker, I took 200 milligrams a week for eight weeks and I put on 20 pounds. I go from looking like a lightweight like that to a, mini dorian yates because <laughs> 20 pounds of muscle on my frame is a lot so that's, like... that's uh it's it's great to always talk to you and stuff and and to be able to show just the the time that you've put in and and that we finish up at the same kind of position people can change their bodies if they just stay with the nutrition stay mm -hmm. consistent train smart um if you want to go extreme like we have at our times, you could you could create something beautiful. But going the other route where everybody says this is what health and fitness is, it's it's just guys. Exactly. Right. It's so not that. It's mm -hmm. so not that. And from somebody that went through teenagers like I did, I love that we had that that learning curve, and we're teaching these people what it's like to be able to put that mm -hmm. foundation foundation yeah. work into it. You, you trained yeah, for seven years. Too. And the key point is, too, like, yes, getting into contests is, like I said, going to the extreme where you've got to solely, fo solely focus on contests. But for the average person who just wants to train to get in shape, you know, just get that mindset. But the key is keep it fun. Have fun doing yeah. it. Enjoy it. I said, don't make it a chore. Don't be like, this is all I can eat. Oh, I've got to go to the gym. You know, then you start hating it. You start resenting it. Keep it fun. It's like even sometimes I'd be like treadmill. Oh, I don't feel like doing treadmill today. So I go outside, walk around the beach. Even though you're doing cardio, it doesn't feel like it because you're outside, you're looking at the beach, you're seeing people saying hello. Totally <laughs> different. So there's so many things you can do to change it up, make it fun. Some days you might not want to go to the gym. Well, don't. Stay home. Find the bar. Do chin-ups. Wait, hold on. Do Why would anybody want to go to the gym? Uh, Come on. Yeah, it's like, but at the end of those days, for the average person who's just still keen to exercise, I said, one day, if you don't want to go to the gym, do body weight exercise at home. Do push-ups, do sit-ups, do chin-ups. There's so many variations you can do that's still going to work. It's just a different type of body workout. You know, I remember back in the old days, if I didn't go to the gym, do you remember those old bull workers? You could oh, yeah. pull on them and push them. Yep. <laughs> like ice attention. Or even they'd say, like, in the booklet, once I'd finished doing that, I'd stand there for, like, a couple of minutes, and you just push your hands together, squeeze in your chest for minutes like this, the ice attention. <laughs> Or you get those yeah. old, remember the home gym set that would come with the springs? Like you remember the, the spring? You remember yeah. this one? Yeah. Remember the chest expander that had the springs in it? And if you had chest hair and you yep. let it go, you catch your chest hair. You're like, oh, shit. <laughs> so Robbie and then these, the hand, had... the hand. Oh, oh, yeah, I yeah. sit there all day with the hand squeezes. <laughs> order, order, order a new one. I got to have my grippers. Brother, uh, thank you so much, man. Is there anything oh, thank you, you. Want to tell these people? Uh, like I said, just like I said, don't worry about other people. That's one main thing. You know, focus on yourself. It's like I said, it's good to look at other people if you want inspiration. But when you look at Mike, look at him for inspiration. Uh, I'm sure the ones that look at you and go, uh, drugs, this, that, they're not the ones, they're not really into it anyway. Because anyone that thinks that, like I said, their mind's already gone. I said, if they're thinking, oh, you've got to take drugs to be like this, then you're already. You're already losing. If that's your mindset to begin with, you're already gone. You're so alive. it should be, you know what? I want to get in shape. I can do this. Yes, it's going to be hard. But like I said, just baby steps. Like I said, if you've been overweight for a long time, it's going to be hard. It doesn't have to be super hard. But yes, it's going to be 
hard in the beginning, but then, you know, once you get going, I said, it's just a matter of just like you train your body, you got to train your mind. Like, I haven't been on a clean eating diet like this since 2013, since I won the universe. So it's like seven, eight years for me now. And even me getting on this two weeks in, like I said, two days ago, I was into the chocolate Easter egg going, I can't do it anymore. I can't, I can't do it. I'm like, no, Lee, come on, you can do it. Get back on the idea. So um, it's like, you know, like I said, we all slip up. So if you do slip up, don't beat yourself up over it. It's just one little slip up, get back on to the eating clean again. But, you know, so it's going to be worth it in the end. And like I said, when you get there, you'll get there. Like I said, don't expect it overnight because, like I said, if you've been overweight for 10, 15 years, getting in shape ain't going to happen quick. You just make little changes. And when you see those little changes, just go. But in the beginning, you might not see no changes, but it will happen. And like I said, like you train your body, you need to train your mind just as much. And just as I said, just stay positive on the whole thing. You know, we, you trust me, I can say stay positive, but trust me, Mike's probably had it. I have it. We have, like I said, we have days where, we're totally negative beating ourselves up. It's like even the greatest athletes have those days where doubt creeps in and you're like, you know what, I can't do it anymore, this sort of thing. But you know what? I always just figure if you've got your health and you can get up and do it, do it. Because, you know, I've had friends who'd be like, I can't do this anymore. I wish I was dead. I'm like, how can you even think that way? I said, why would you even yeah. think that? I said, because there's somebody there right now. You've got your whole life ahead of you. You can make the changes to be healthier. You can do whatever you want. Somebody now is actually laying on their deathbed, taking their last breath, thinking, I wish I had more time. And yet you have all this time and you're wishing you were dead. So it's just like, you know, you just got to put things into perspective. And like I said, we're all going to have bad days, hard days, stressful days, but, you know, appreciate the good ones. And, you know, with the right mindset, you can make them more good than bad. But like I said, we're all going to slip up now and then, but don't beat yourself up over it. Just write that off and start afresh again the next day. One of the things you said, and I agree with it, and I heard a great quote. He said, um, I don't know who it was, but it was beautiful. He says, a healthy man wants so much, so many things. A sick man wants one thing. Yeah. <laughs> keep that in mind, folks. Everybody out there, yeah. keep that in mind. So right now, will you want everything? Oof. One day you're going to look back and just. And, and, you're gonna... and, let me, and let me just put a thing on that. My friend just came back. Two weeks ago, we spent a month in South Sudan with the different tribes and that. And there's one thing I noticed when he travels the world a lot and sends me videos and photos, and it's so true. I always found when he goes to these islands or the tribes where they're one of the tribes actually shower when there's no water because of the droughts, they shower in cow urine. So the cows peeing, and that's how they're washing themselves and stuff like that. So it's like, but yet he videos the kids, they're playing in the dirt with sticks, and it's so weird that. I see these people all around the world, everyone I've traveled, the people who have the least are generally the happiest. I mean, like yeah. they're happy. They've got hardly anything. And you look at society today here in Australia, America, people have cars, houses, boats. Kids have the latest iPhones, PlayStations. Yeah. But yet depression, anxiety, suicides through the roof. I'm sure these people in these tribes, if you said suicide, anxiety, they'd be like, what are you talking about? They wouldn't even know what that is. So it's just crazy that, you know, people can have the littlest in life but be the happiest and you can have everything and be totally unhappy, stressed out, depressed, on medications. It's like, it's just crazy. And like I said, that just comes back to mindset, you know. It's always, I always said too, it's a matter of, like I said, wants and needs. It's like you need food, you need your health, you need this. Want, you want a Ferrari, you want this, I want that. But sadly, people focus more on what they want rather than what they need and, you know, you need love, you need friendship, you need, you know, if you have all these things that you need, you can get by in very minimal and have a good life. That's when you focus more on, I have a 7-inch TV, but I want an 85-inch TV, but I don't have it. Oh, fuck this. Or, I want the new iPhone, but I don't have it. Oh, fuck this. It's like, you know, when you start con concentrating on the wants, that's when you start getting all depressed and negative, or you might have a Mercedes and someone has a Ferrari. I want a Ferrari. You got a fucking Mercedes. Be happy with what you have. You don't need that Ferrari. Yes, I don't. You don't. So you know, it's just you got to put things in perspective. <laughs> I love it, Lee. Man, thanks for taking time today, brother. Uh, thank you. I look forward to seeing you, and I'll be over there in a, about eight weeks. What are you going to train? What are we going to train when you're here? Are we going to train to get oh, some I thought, stuff go, I thought we'd go to Disneyland and ride the rides and eat corn dogs. What are you talking about training? <laughs> <laughs> That's a video. Um, I cannot wait to see you, brother, man. I'm so looking forward to this. Yeah. Uh, speaking to um, Frank, Frank, too, might hopefully try and make it down to the beach. 
Oh, okay. No, he already said he was. I talked to him. Okay. Uh, be good. Be good. Uh, yeah, everybody's everybody's excited to having you out here and stuff. Yeah, twenty twenty seven with uh, Fred Carrillo. That was the first thing he says. He goes, "Man, I've been talking to Lee Priest and all this." And so, you and Frank have to team up to get uh, a little boxing in. Get work with yeah. some of the coaches and stuff. Because I know you <laughs> love it. I know you love it, and he's yeah. such a. He was a D one wrestler. Yeah. He's he's and a there's a guy too. There's a guy too. Look at look at Frank. He's like what fifty four now, is he? Fifty seven. Fifty seven. Look at the shape he's in. So you know, I don't want any people make excuses. I'm oh, look at some of the even Arnold. He still gets around. So you know, age is just a number. It all comes down to mindset. Frank's a positive guy. These yeah. people that are positive, you can keep going as long as if this keeps going, you'll keep going. That means in anything. I've known people. I've had an auntie who had cancer. Until she found out she had cancer, she was full of life. The doctor told her she had cancer. This turned off. She's like, I'm going to die, going to die. Two months later, she was dead. She went from being the happiest, full of energy, dead in two months. And I've known people that get cancer, and they're like, okay, right, I've got cancer. It's not a death sentence. I can try and beat it, doing the chemo, whatever else, and they've beat it. So, you know, your mind is the most powerful tool you're ever going to have. And, you know, it's like. You're dropping knowledge today, brother. Life knowledge which I appreciate. Thank as you. As, all can still, as long as I can still remember, I'm not that age yet where it's like, even now with the doing the training, people are like, Lee, you can do it. You can do it. Muscle memory. I'm like, Oh, I don't know. I think my muscle has Alzheimer's. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for hanging today, brother. I'll see you in uh, May. Thank you. See you then.